The very phrase, the unpardonable sin, strikes fear into most sober-minded people. Is there such a thing as the unpardonable sin? Well, the Bible talks about an unpardonable sin. And that's kind of terrifying. When you think about it, what we've been talking about all day, and, and every time we get together, we give testimonies, we sing songs, and we hear scripture, we say, man, Jesus saves. The power, um, the blood will never lose its power. There's power in the blood, and we hear all these things, and we hear about forgiveness, and boy, isn't it good that if we come to Christ, he can forgive us. Isn't that good? Some of you get it. That's good. But listen. The Bible says there is a sin that isn't forgiven. Oh, me. What is that? And if there is no forgiveness, and I've committed it, then I'm lost, and there's no point in anything. It's interesting, over the years, since I've been uh, ordained, I was ordained in 1992, and even before I was ordained, just even doing ministry, this is probably one of the most intense questions that folks have asked me on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and in probably the most often repeated spiritual question is, how do I know if I've committed the unpardonable sin? And if I've committed the unpardonable sin, am I done? Am I just to try to live it up now because I'm going to hell anyway? It's a terrifying concept, this concept of the unpardonable sin. I want to take a few minutes and I want to explain what the Bible teaches about this. And I need everybody to, to listen very carefully and intently and not miss any pieces. This morning we're going to study the subject and by the grace of God, we will receive warning, hope, and forgiveness for the unpardonable sin. The first thing that we need to do when studying this passage, and we are in the book of Mark uh, chapter 3 and verses 22 through 30 is what we're looking at, we need to understand what's going on here. We need to understand the context First thing that we need to do is we need to identify the power of darkness. Look at Mark chapter 3 and verse 22. And the scribes, which came down from Jerusalem, said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. Now, the accusation here is that Jesus is doing all of this stuff, and he is doing all these miracles. And uh, the Pharisees, now the Pharisees, you need to understand who the Pharisees are. The Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. These were the folks that were seen as the authorities, the authorities on Scripture, the authorities on what you're supposed to believe. Just because they proclaimed themselves authorities didn't make them authorities. Amen? 
Jesus was kind of shaking their whole world because Jesus was coming and turning their authority and their, um, their power on its ear because here comes this uh, Jesus and, and he, he not only has way more knowledge than the Pharisees, uh, but he's exposing their hypocrisy and he has the power of God. So the Pharisees don't like him much. Not only is Jesus coming and teaching stuff and people are he hearing uh, great words and finding rest for their souls and all the stuff in the Old Testament is now finally making sense and they're starting to see, oh, this is the Messiah. Man, this is really good. Not only have they seen that, but they're seeing some real, powerful, and kind of creepy spiritual things happen. So you have folks that are coming along, and they got three or four voices coming out of one mouth. Okay, that's on the creepy side. What do you think? And so you got you got these these guys. You got several voices coming out of one mouth, and these they're being twisted and turned around, and they're introducing themselves, saying, "I am legion, for we are many." You say, "Okay, that's creepy." And Jesus says, "Hey, be quiet," and they're quiet. Hey, you get out, and they leave. Whoa! All these quote-unquote authorities, they never had power like that. All these quote-unquote authorities, they never were able to heal or rebuke a spirit of dumbness and say, you get out of him, you spirit of dumbness. And you, all of a sudden, the guy starts talking again. Whoa! So now... The Pharisees, they're losing ground. So they got to just start spreading crazy stuff to try to gain back ground. Kind of like what happens in our politics today. If somebody starts losing ground, all of a sudden, the more he, somebody thinks they're losing ground, the crazier the accusations of the other has to be. So... They start saying, well, uh, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, he has power over the devil. But the reason why he had power over the devil is the devil gave him power over the devil. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But I want you to understand, when you're asking yourself, oh my goodness, have I committed the unpardonable sin, folks would say, okay, I may have sworn a certain way, or I may have, might have sworn and used the, said something about the Holy Spirit, or I might have done something like that. Has that the unpardonable sin? I want you to understand that the unpardonable sin has something to do with what authority you say Jesus did the miracles by. Okay? So these guys are saying Jesus' power is coming from the devil. You need to identify the real enemy. Is the real enemy Jesus because he is running by the power of the devil? Or is the real enemy the devil? Now, one of the tricks of the devil, a great way to identify if somebody is working in the power of darkness is the devil is an accuser. So keep your finger here and go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. We'll start with verse 9. Revelation is the last book in the Bible. Revelation chapter 12. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world, he was cast down to the earth, and the angels were cast out with him. And I heard a, a loud voice in heaven saying, Now has come salvation and strength, the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. Here he is. For the, what's his title? Accuser of our brethren. Okay, 
So let's get a hold of this. The accuser of our brethren is cast down. So we got lots of names for the same guy. That old dragon, the serpent, the devil. You, you, you can, uh, yeah, Satan, that old serpent, the devil, Satan. You got all these titles, and then one last title, put it together, the accuser. I want you to understand something. There is force, There are forces of darkness at work when there's accusation, especially false accusation going on. The devil's pointy finger wants to come up into your face and say, I think you've done it. I think you've done something Jesus can't forgive. I think you've committed the unpardonable sin. The accuser. So we have the accuser here going to Jesus saying, are going about Jesus, not going to Jesus. They're going around about Jesus saying, well, the reason why he does that is because he has the power of the devil. Well, we need to identify the forces of darkness. The forces of darkness do false accusation. That's the real force of darkness. We need to understand this about the forces of darkness. Their kingdom is not divided against itself. They're kind of an organized group. And Jesus even said this. Look, guys, you're losing your logic here a little bit. Verse 23. He called, unto, and he called them unto him. I love this, by the way. The scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath the power of Beelzebub, and by prince of the prince of the devil, he cast out devils. Now, you, you understand, this, and this is generally the way it works with accusers. Were they saying this to Jesus? No, they were saying this to everybody else. I want you to get this. This is the way Satan and his forces work. They don't take on the truth face to face. No, they went around to everybody else saying, well, you know why it's happening. I'll tell you why it's happening. Because I, I am an authority, and I can tell you that the reason why this is happening is that he is doing it by the power of the devil. Now, there are folks that are intimidated by the religious authorities, and even though what they're saying is stupid, yet because a religious authority says it, maybe he puts his collar on backwards or wears a robe or something else, and he's doing something like that, and he says, you know, this is true. And all of a sudden you can say, Whoa, I didn't know that. You could even think, that doesn't even make sense to me, but this was no religious authority that says it, so it must be true. It's like today, if you read it on the internet, you know it's true. They wouldn't let it on the internet if it wasn't true, amen. <laughs> so, you have that going on, and Jesus says, um, wait a minute. What does he do in verse 23? He calls them unto him. I love that. I want you to understand something. This is all about who has what authority. He's saying, oh, it's a power of the devil that he has authority. And what does he do? He says, come here. I want to talk to you. He's going to take them on. By the way, <laughs> isn't it interesting? They're saying, you know, he has the power of the devil. That's why he's able to do this. And that's what they say, right? That's what they say they believe. And he says, come here. And what they do, they obeyed him. <laughs> Is that not a little interesting? Come here. Okay. So he showed, uh, they show up and he says, all right, look. Does this even make sense? A house divided against itself can't fall, or is going to fall. They can't stand. Verse 23. How can Satan cast down Satan? If a kingdom be divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. If a house be divided against itself, the house cannot stand. If Satan rise up against himself, he be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. You're watching these people with many voices coming out of one mouth. You're watching 
these people absolutely possessed to the devil, is his kingdom standing here on earth? Yeah. Um, this does not look like a divided kingdom. This doesn't even make sense. The Apostle Paul tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, this present world. The Bible calls the devil the prince of the power of the air. Now, is there an organized group out there? Yes. Are there organized uh, are the devils in ranks? Yes, they are. But here's the sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is doing a miracle. Something is happening. And they couldn't deny that. You have somebody who is possessed of the devil. Jesus says, and, and, and they're making all kinds of noise and chaos and scary stuff. And Jesus says, hey, be quiet. And they're quiet. Now, nobody else could say that. Jesus had power. You know, there were other people that claimed to have power. There were the seven sons of Sceva in Acts chapter 13, I believe it was. And they said, I adjure you by the Jesus that Paul's preach. And they said, Jesus we know. Paul we know. But who are you? <laughs> and the devil in the one guy beat up the seven guys that came after him and tore them up, and they ran away from there naked and wounded. That didn't work out so well. Why? Jesus is the one that has the power. So the question is, who, what, what's the power behind this? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, then, is saying the reason why Jesus has power is because he has and he is demon possessed and he has been granted power over demons by Satan the prince of demons are you with me that's what it is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit so you gotta identify the power of darkness we've identified the real power of darkness that's the devil, the accuser. Are you with me? Jesus is not the power of darkness. Now, so once we identify the power of darkness, let's identify the power of light. The power of light is Jesus. Now, in order, I love how Jesus explains this. Look at verse 27. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he ver uh, first bind the strong man, then will he spoil his house. So he's saying, look it. You can't go in to a big, strong, burly guy's house who is a 10th degree black belt in martial arts and uh, you know what, let's, let's break it down. Let's go back. You can't go break into Chuck Norris's house. Amen? You with me? Unless you tie him up first. You need to make him sleepy. You need to tie him up. You need to tie him to the bed. And you need to bar the door. And then maybe you can go steal his stuff. Maybe. But man, you're not going to be able to face Chuck Norris on your own. And that's, the, that's really what Jesus was saying in this parable. Nobody's going to go into Chuck Norris's house unless somebody does something with Chuck Norris. He would still just absolutely entertain us with your tragedy. Anyway, listen. Someone says that. And Jesus is saying, um, someone's got to bind a strong man. Now, I just went into Satan's house. I just came in. There was 
you know, there was a case where he dealt with legion. Well, you wonder how many is legion? Well, let's see. There was, there was enough devils in that one guy to possess 2,000 pigs. Now, I would say that's a formidable strong man. What do you think? Now, I want you to get something. Jesus is saying, not only do we identify the forces of darkness, but I want you to understand the force of light. The forces of darkness are scary. You know, I've done my scary voice before, and everybody's like, oh, and I'm just a, just a guy. I don't have any forces of darkness, you know. But I can do a scary voice, and people say, oh, don't do that. It scares me. But listen, people talk about the devil, and you, and you know what? I've seen demon-possessed folks, and it's a little on the weird side. And it's scary. But here's the thing. You name the name of Jesus, and you say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and by the power of his shed blood, you be silent, and they're quiet. Whoa! Me! What is that? That's the power of light. Oh, yeah, power of darkness is scary. Roaring, like, you know, running around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Roaring. He makes a lot of noise. Do you know what? The power of light silences darkness. Can you ever think in a place where you have light, can darkness exist when you turn the light on? Man, get a hold of that. You got the power of darkness. Oh, yeah, big, scary, dark. Turn the light on. Jesus, boom, the darkness is gone. Jesus is saying, listen to me. It's not about Satan casting out Satan. That doesn't even make sense. But I will tell you this. I was able to cast him out because I could bind a strong man. Now, you identify the power of light. You realize Jesus can bind a strong man. Fakers, they don't have the real power. It's Acts chapter 19. Um, yeah, let's go there. Acts chapter 19. It's kind of a fun story. I was just talking to one of our bus kids. It might be good to tell him this story because uh, we had... Uh, one of our bus kids on, on uh, Friday night, we were reviewing some of the stories, and, and he told some of the stories from the Old Testament in, from, from his perspective. Man, that, that fellow could tell a story. I just imagine what he'd do with this story. Anyway, verse 13. And certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered. And you could just picture a deep, dark, scary voice. I won't do it. I, I want to, but I won't. Jesus, I know. Paul, I know, but who are you? And the man whom had the evil spirit was leapt on them, overcame them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. I want to tell you something. Fakers don't have the power of Jesus. They don't have the power of light. Just because someone can say an incantation, that doesn't make them an exorcist. Can I say something, hopefully, without you losing track of everything that I said? You know, even a broken clock is right twice a day. And I don't encourage you to do this, but, you know... Um, Hollywood is fascinated with demon possession. The Exorcist, terrible, scary movie, but they kind of got something right. You know what it was? 
Just no. Just because a priest thought he could be the exorcist, guess what? He ended up not having power over the forces of darkness, but getting possessed and killing himself. Kind of like the pigs. But let me tell you something. When Jesus comes over, they didn't possess Jesus. They got out and asked for forgiveness. <laughs> they got out and they ran scared. Why? Because that's the real power of light. Amen. It's not like the what the... What the, the um, Hollywood would tell you is that nobody really has the power of the forces of darkness. You know what? That's what the forces of darkness would like you to think. But I'll tell you, when Jesus shows up, you can't have light and darkness in the same space. By the way, let me just go on this for a minute. If you've been saved, that means the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Amen? Amen. Now, let me ask you something. People say, well, I've been saved, but I'm afraid I got possessed by the devil. Do you really think that the devil is brave enough to show up in a heart where God already is? It can't happen. It cannot happen. Now, I want to give you something here. We've identified the forces of darkness. We've identified the forces of light. Now, choose wisely. Verse 28, Verily, I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wheresoever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost shall never, hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because he has said he hath an unclean spirit. Now, is he saying that you can never get forgiveness? No, he's saying as long as you are saying that Jesus is running under the power of Satan, guess what? If Jesus is running under the power of Satan, you have no Savior. So as long as you believe that there is no Savior, <laughs> you can't be saved. That makes sense. So don't let the devil point his finger in your face and say, well, you've, uh, maybe I, I said something under my breath, or maybe I had some vision in my head, or some other thing that people will imagine. Maybe I've committed the, the unpardonable sin. Here's the deal. If you believe that Jesus is running under the power of Satan, then you can't be forgiven until you figure out that he's not running under the power of Satan. Then you realize he's running under the power of God, and he does have the power to bind a strong man, and he has the power to break your bondage, and he has the power to set you free. You get a hold of that, then you get forgiveness. Now, understand, I love this. Even there, this unpardonable sin, he says he is in danger of hellfire. He didn't say he's going to hell. Get a hold of that. He didn't say, listen, too bad, so sad, you already messed up, you're not going to get forgiven. He says, as long as you believe that, you're not going to get forgiven. You're in danger. But so long as you quit believing that, and realize, you know what? It isn't the forces of darkness that's running Jesus. It is the force of light that's running Jesus. And he is my only hope. You get a hold of that. You have salvation. And there is nothing that can take that away. Right. So the forces of darkness, again, they want, they, man, it's all about intimidation. They want you to think that you'll never get power over your sin. You'll never get set free from the bondage that binds you. You'll never get forgiveness. You'll never have a new life. And I want you to understand, listen to me, they're barking loud. And they're scary when the lights are off. But when Jesus shows up, they're like cockroaches. Boom! Gone! I want to finish with a little story. I won't tell you a lot of detail, but I'll just tell you this. Like I said, I've been, uh, I've seen some stuff. Been involved in deliverances, been involved where there's folks that, yeah, I'm pretty sure they have some unwelcome guests along for the ride. Give you that feeling when you have more than one voice coming out of one mouth. Amen. 
But it, and, and, and you know what? Like any sane person, it scared the tar out of me. Without even thinking. Without, it's like my defensive move. In the name of Jesus, and by the power of his shed blood, you be quiet. And they were. Now, you know what? Yeah, exactly. That weirded me out more than hearing the voice in the first place. You know what I found? No matter how dark, no matter how scary, no matter how uh, looming the force of darkness seem to be, when you name the name of Jesus and you stand under the power of his shed blood, there is no enemy, no force, nothing that can stand against you. Because of your great power? <laughs> no. Seven sons of Sceva running naked and wounded. It wasn't their power. It wasn't some incantation. Well, tell me the, the magic words to say. That wasn't it. It's not magic words. It's the name above all names. The name that every creature will bow to someday. The forces in heaven. The forces on earth. And every force under the earth will name the name of Jesus and acknowledge that he is Lord. 